Okay, so we've been talking about rational functions, and we've been talking about writing rational functions as the sum of simple rational functions. And in particular, we've made the observation that how we do this depends on how the denominator of the function factors. And we've looked at the case. Well, first of all, let me just jot a few sort of introductory comments from yesterday. Again, we're looking at rational functions. We're looking specifically at rational functions where the degree of the top is less than the degree of the denominator. And we're looking at how this denominator factors. So it's a fact of, um, well, of cottage algebra, I guess, so that every polynomial factors up to a point. By which I mean every polynomial is the product of linear terms and or quadratic terms that do not So any polynomial can be written as you know, something like a linear term times a linear term times this, just to pick something out of the air. And this quadratic doesn't factor any further. And the way we know whether a quadratic factors is by asking if it has real valued roots. This quadratic has no roots, or I guess more formally, I should say that its roots are imaginary, are complex, so it doesn't factor any further. So every, um, every polynomial can be factored like this. And you know, you might not have all of those terms. Maybe, um, maybe there aren't any quadratic terms when you factor it, for example. Maybe when you factor it, one of these terms gets raised to a power. But in theory, every quadratic factor and we sort of talked about that um, yesterday the, uh, in, you know, day-to-day -day life, in like college algebra. If we say that a quadratic factors, what we mean is that we can factor it easily using the techniques that we teach in 102 or wherever. But... If we have something like this, and let me, uh, let me, I might be modifying this cubic in a bit, so don't write it down just yet. Cubed, 7x squared minus x plus 1. plus seven x squared minus x plus one. Yeah, let me change this a little. Let me change that plus one 
to a minus. I mean, that minus one to a minus three. I mean, something like this factors into linear pieces and the way you would factor this is to pull that two out. So we just have a one as our leading coefficient. And then we would go to Desmos. So we factor the two out. And then we find the roots, and the roots are messy, but this is going to factor as x minus the first root times x minus the second root times x minus the third root. And um, in this case, it factors perfectly if there are fewer roots than the degree, you wind up with a mess. Um, I'm not going to to obsess about the details, but but the point is we're getting a little sort of off uh, track, maybe. The point is that when you factor the bottom, you can get linear terms, you can get linear terms raised to powers, you can get quadratic terms, you can get quadratic terms raised to powers. And when we do the partial fraction decomposition, this product in the denominator turns into a sum. And we saw how that worked yesterday when we had linear terms not raised to powers. If we have linear terms not raised to powers, we get terms that look like this. Constants divided by the linear terms. And we saw how we can deal with that. We did the partial fraction decomposition. We saw how we can find A and B using the heavy side method. And we did an integral problem. So, um, and probably, or maybe imagine what we're going to do now. These are the four terms we can have in a denominator. Yesterday, we asked ourselves what happens in the linear case. And we answered. Well, in the linear case, when we have just a linear term, 
we get a factor that looks like that, the constant divided by the linear term. So now we'll ask, well, what happens if we have a linear term raised to a power? What does that contribute? What if we have a quadratic? What does that contribute? What if we have a quadratic raised to a power? What does that contribute? And um, when I say it like that, it might sound like this is going to be quite the lecture um, because we spent all of yesterday looking at the one case and now we have three other cases to consider. But the case I spent a lot of time on yesterday was the case that I think is really the important one which is why I spent so much time on it. We may have three cases today, but we're not going to spend as much time on any of that as we did on this first case yesterday. So, Just to summarize in the quickest possible way, if we have a linear term down here, not raised to a power, that's a good case. This linear term down here, not raised to a power, is going to give us something that looks like this in the sum. And the reason I call it good Well, first of all, it's easy to find A. And anytime someone says that anything in calculus is easy, they're not being literal. What they mean is that it could be worse. Um, we can find A using the heavy side method of picking X values and sticking them in. And then, I mean, this is an integration tool, remember. And this works as an integration tool because capital A over lowercase ax plus b is something we can integrate. So, Case two going to be what if in the denominator we have a linear term, but it's raised to a power. Well, when we factor this, we get multiple factors, multiple summands is I guess the technical phrase. We get A, let's say A sub one over AX plus B, then A sub two over AX plus B squared, A sub three, over AX plus B cubed. And this pattern repeats until we get A sub K over AX plus B raised to the K power.
I said that case one was a good case. Let's call case two a medium good. It's harder to find the constants a sub one, a sub two, up to a sub k. The heavy side method doesn't work here, so we have to mess around and try other things. But these terms we get are all things we can integrate. I mean, it will get a little tedious after a while because all of these require a minor bit of U substitution. But since integration by parts is being present, I mean, sorry, since partial fractions is being presented as an integration technique, it would be a shame to do the partial fractions and then wind up with something you can't integrate anyway. And that doesn't happen here. So let's see. I'm presenting these as multiple distinct cases, but that's not really true. Let's try to integrate 2x plus 1 over x minus 4 times x plus 2 cubed. Nice. So I've sort of presented these as case one, case two, what we can have, of course, these cases working together and the partial fraction decomposition is something over that first term, plus something else. I'm just going to count up in the alphabet. Over that second term, plus something else. Over that second term squared, plus something else. Over that second term cubed. And now that we have, um, Now that we've reached the power, now that we've reached the same three that we had in the denominator, we stop counting up. And each of those terms we can integrate. So if we can find A, B, C, and D, we'll be golden. And the reason I said that having that having this case is only medium good is that finding that A, B, C, and D is going to be kind of a hassle. But let's see what we can do. Um, to start with, we do exactly the same thing we did last time, which is um, multiply both sides by the denominator of the left-hand side. Clear the denominator is what we say if we're trying to sound fancy.
So on the left hand side, multiplying the denominator cancels it and leaves you with the numerator. On the right, I mean, this is stuff you might just do in your head, depending on how confident you are in your algebra, but I'll show these additions. Then C, X minus four, X plus two cubed over X plus two squared and awkwardly crammed in X minus four times X plus two cubed over X plus two cubed. And we see that all of these are going to experience some kind of cancellation. And at the very least, everything on the right is going to stop being a fraction. The denominator is always going to completely cancel. And for space reasons, I'm going to do cancellation via scribbling instead of writing it all over again. That x minus four and that x minus four will go away. This x plus two will cancel one of those x plus twos, leaving us with two remaining. This x plus two squared will cancel two of those x plus twos, leaving us with one remaining. And this x plus two cubed will get rid of all of the x plus twos, leaving us only with the x minus four. Two x plus one equals capital A times x plus two squared plus capital B, uh, x minus four, wait, x plus two cubed, sorry about that. Capital B, x minus four, and then an x plus two squared, and a C, x minus four squared, x plus two to the first, and a d, and then just an x minus four. Let me just make sure, d, x minus four, c, x minus four is not, I thought I was thinking of this as some kind of uh, binomial thing, but it's not. X minus four is not being raised to powers ever. Hey, does that look right to you, everyone? Then we'll we'll get what we can using a heavy side like method. It's not going to be as cute or as efficient as it was in the previous case. But the heavy side method said 
Well, you should pick terms that will make stuff equal to zero. And let's see what happens if we pick x equals negative two. So negative two times two is negative four, plus one is negative three. And then almost everything will go away because negative two plus two is zero. So we have a zero cubed and a zero squared and a zero. The only term that doesn't go away is this D. Negative two minus four is negative six. So D is one half. And then um, X equals four gives us something. Eight plus one is nine equals A. Okay. We are reaching and surpassing my, my mental arithmetic. Um, four plus two is six. Six cubed is 216. And then everything else goes away. A bear of a problem, but unless you make things very artificial. Um, this is just sort of what it's like using partial fraction decomposition in this case. So good news, bad news. I mean, we found A and we found D and we needed both of those. So that's good news. The bad news is the only numbers we have to plug in that will make stuff zero are negative two and positive four. And we used both of those and we still don't know what B and C are. A and D, we know. B and C are a mystery. And here's where things get ugly. And I'll fight my way through as best I can. Um, what we're going to have to do once the heavy side method fails, or let, let's be optimistic, let's be positive. Once the heavy side method only partially succeeds, what we're going to have to do is factor everything on the right. And I think, I mean, we know D and we know A. I think for now, I'm not going to plug those in because factoring this is already going to be a headache. We're foiling it, the opposite of factoring. But foiling all this is already going to be a headache and having one halves and nine two hundred sixteenths floating around would just make it more of a headache. So we've got this A times X plus two times x plus two times x plus two. So that's x squared plus four x plus four times x plus two is a times 
Okay, so we're not foiling exactly, but it's the same property. I mean, it's the same idea, except instead of first, outer, inner, last, we also have a middle term that needs to be multiplied by everything. So x squared times x, x squared times 2, 4x times x, 4x times 2, 4 times x, 4 times 2. is a times, let's see, x cubed. What are our x squared? We've got a 4x squared and a 2x squared. Got an 8x and a 4x. We've got an 8. Uh, and we're going to have to finish multiplying everything out. I do not think we're going to have time to finish this menace of a problem, but we'll do what we can. So we've, uh, we've seen what this looks like. Now we have B times um, x minus 4 times x plus 2. x plus 2 raised to a power, x plus 2 times x plus 2. So x squared minus 4x plus 2x is minus 2x minus 8 times x plus 2. Here, I'll finish this, but then I'm just going, because we're definitely not going to have time to finish, I'll just sort of skip uh, once we get this done, what do we do with all of these? Um, x cubed, then let's see, a uh, 2x squared minus 2x squared, so we have no x squared, a minus 4x and a minus 8x, so a minus 12x, and then a negative eight and a positive two is a negative 16. If I've done this correctly, and then we repeat this. Um, we repeat it with this, we repeat it with that, and we get the 2x plus 1 equals some monstrous polynomial. And this polynomial is going to be a third degree polynomial. So kind of summarizing the method here, and again, I don't think, I don't think in, in this day and age, we really should be doing this by hand. So just kind of summarizing the method. We find that 2x plus 1 is some enormous polynomial.
and for two polynomials to be equal. Again, this equal sign is deceptive. You see that equal sign and you think, okay, so we use the quadratic form to the, or the cubic form to the, or whatever. What we really should have here is an identically equal sign. This isn't something we want to solve. This is something where we're just telling you, no, the left and the right are always equal. Well, the only way for two polynomials to be identically equal is for their coefficients to be the same. So we set to zero equal to that thing in front of the x cubed. And we set zero equal to this thing in front of the x squared. And we set two equal to this thing in front of the x. And we set this one equal to whatever that constant is. And what this gives you is a system of linear equations. And then the textbook just sort of pretends that you, everyone knows how to solve a system of linear equations, even though that material is really presented in math 337, so it's probably not true. But I mean, the idea is that you have like a bunch of Bs and Cs and D's in there just making stuff up, but I mean, if you know you have a bunch of A's and B's and C's, so we wind up with equations that look like this. And it's always possible to solve a system like this, except again, I don't, I'm not convinced that you'll have seen the way to solve an equation like this before. We definitely learn it in 337, but you haven't taken that class yet. So doing the, uh, finding these coefficients by hand is, um, is a struggle. And again, it's something where I'd say, well, really, what are you doing? I mean, in, uh, can't, can't a computer do that for you? But once, I mean, once we've found these things, we should be able to integrate this with a quick U substitution, should be able to integrate this with a quick U substitution, integrate this with a quick U substitution, integrate this with a quick U substitution. Uh, the only comment I make, I mean, this is more of a reminder, but when we integrate this, we'll get a natural log. And when we integrate this, we'll get a natural log. When we integrate this and when we integrate this, we won't get natural logs, we'll get powers. Because this is 
x minus 2 to the negative first. And to integrate that, we bump the negative 2 up. It turns into negative 1. And then we divide by it. Similarly, this is x plus 2 to the negative third. And to integrate that, we bump the negative 3 up to negative 2 and then divide by it. So let's see, six minutes left. Um, I'll call it here. We can talk just five minutes or whatever on the quadratic pace tomorrow, but I mean, the quadratic case is the worst case. The quadratic case is the case where you can do all of the decomposition and then you still can't take the integral. So what was any of that for? So it's not something I want to, to spend a huge